Um, my name is Eva Fast, and I work in the Soderquist College of Business, and I get to introduce you to our speaker tonight. So if you have seen the posters around campus of the lady in the orange hammock, she has arrived, and she is here. Um, yes. So I'm personally really excited for each of you to get to hear what she has to say tonight. Um, this is, we've invited Haley as part of our Working for the Common Good speaker series in the College of Business, um, also sponsored by the Center for Faith and Flourishing. Mm -hmm. And so Haley is going to talk about her experience as CEO at Kamek and building a redemptive business. And what does that really mean? How can we stretch our understanding of how faith informs business? So Haley Robeson Dake is a Praxis Venture Partner. Um, she was previously the CEO at Kamek, an outdoor brand based in Austin, Texas, that designs performance gear to elevate time outside. Having previously worked at IDEO, Bain and Consulting Company, and Stanford University, Haley's most inspired at the intersection of design, business, and education. Haley holds a BA in Business and Finance from UT Austin and a joint MBA and MED from Stanford University. She is a National Outdoor Leadership School graduate and worked as a field instructor in Wyoming, leading outdoor expeditions focused on personal leadership. Haley most enjoys adventuring outside with her husband Christian, son James, and dog Callie. And so tonight she's going to share her story, and then we'll have time at the end for any <coughs> Q&A and questions that you have for her. Um, but here's Haley and her talk on building a redemptive business. Thanks. I was just about to grab the mic, and then I realized, oh, I've got one, <laughs> a, a big mic. I've never had something like this before, and I thought this might happen. And so the first slide that I have for you is a photo of my husband at a pop-up event in Austin to get a lot of people outside. My husband's a botanist. He was had his own pop-up booth with plants and cacti and succulents that he was selling. And someone had, I don't know, have any of you ever been on a bicycle that's like two or three bicycles high? No one? It's going to be the new thing next week. So everyone at the fair thought, I'm not getting on that bike. And my husband, uh, who we met, we got married a year and a half ago, and or a year ago. We have a six-month-old, so a lot of life change happening for me recently. But met this guy a few years ago, and he just jumps up, gets on that bike. And I had a video clip. We weren't able to get it. But he's teetering, and everyone at the event's like, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, he's on it. And I don't remember how he got off. But this photo always brings a smile to my face and also reminds me, just do the thing. Just try the thing. And so I knew coming tonight, because I watched videos of past speakers, that there is going to be this distance between me and you that normally makes me pretty uncomfortable. I like the idea of a fireside chat or an interview, but they've asked me to stand here, and they're putting a very professional mic on my face. And I thought, you know what? Just do the thing. Get on the bike. Let's go. So here we go. For the next 30, 45 minutes, I'm going to give you a talk that I've never given. Uh, I want to share a bit about my life story. I'm going to park for a while at Kamek, where I spent almost five years as CEO of a small outdoor gear company in Austin, Texas. But I think it's important before we get there to build up to the journey. Because oftentimes when we hear somebody's story, we think, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. Of course you do that. But if you look back, if you look back, it makes sense. But it often doesn't seem to make sense from the driver's seat. When you're telling your story forward, when I was sitting in your shoes, I had no idea where I'd end up. And guess what? I'm still asking the question of what do I do? And so tonight, I'm going to share a little bit of my personal story, mostly professionally, and about my time at Kamek, unpacking what does it look like to strive to build a redemptive business. And then I would love your questions. At graduate school, we had a program called Talk. This was a time when over 200 students would gather in a room much smaller than this on a Wednesday night and listen to one another share their stories. I was one of five talk coaches for my two years at graduate school, and I spent about 10 hours a week coaching my fellow students from all over the world to share their stories. It was one of the most powerful things that I got to do because I think after coaching 75 of my classmates, I started to notice a few themes. Um, one, 
every single story tracks and reflects the ultimate narrative of the biblical story of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. And all of our stories are shedding light on that much broader, larger narrative, even if we don't claim it and know it. That was really powerful. Also, if you speak from moments of meaning and purpose in your own life, you are likely to connect and resonate and help someone else in their journey. I think we often discredit our own stories, and I admit that I do too. And sometimes it's really hard to tell our stories when we put ourselves at the center. But if we remove ourselves from the center and put God at the center, we have a lot more freedom to share where we've been and our hopes of where we're going. Everyone shares their story for a different reason. Some people wanted to make sense of their past, overcome a fear of public speaking. And tonight, I'm sharing my story because I'm excited to just invite you into my processing of what's been happening over the last 15 years and really to be an encouragement to you and telling my story in hopes that you will all tell each other your stories because that's a really powerful gift. This is one of my favorite, not so favorite questions. How many of you get asked this? Or when you're in school, it's not what do you do, but what are you going to do? What are you majoring in? Okay, what's next? Raise of hands. Do you all get asked this question? Maybe not, maybe at John Brown University, you've redeemed small talk. <laughs> um, so I get asked, what do you do all the time? And I think culturally in the broader narrative of Western society, we now place so much weight in the answer to this question. We look to this answer to somehow reflect and express who we are. And so then finding the job that will be the answer to that question can paralyze us. I know because it paralyzed me. This is, I went to undergraduate at the University of Texas, as Eva said, in Austin, where I'm now back, and there was an escalator in the business school. I don't know if any of you have been there, so now you have a photo to see exactly what it looks like. And the escalator went up three stories, and in my mind, when I was sitting in your shoes and thought, what am I going to do? I pictured an escalator and thought, I better get on the right one, because there was a path that looked somewhat of like an up and to the right line, and I was gonna get on it and end up somewhere that I didn't know when I was 30, but I was gonna have arrived. I was gonna have arrived at this place where I maybe was married, had kids, had a thriving career, but I just needed to get on the right escalator. And I think that um, upon reflection, that, that question was very paralyzing, but now I know that I'm not getting on a right escalator. I'm just taking a next step. We're all just taking a next step because the reality is that work today is not linear. It's incredibly nonlinear. The latest research out of Stanford shows that many of you in your lifetime will have up to four careers and 20 jobs. That's a lot. You're also wired for eternity. There's probably a lot in you that you would want to express through work that you won't get to express because you have to make choices. You have to choose a next job, a next thing. And so tonight, I hope to the end, through my story, to give you a bit of freedom in how do I enter into the next step in work, in vocation, and trust that God is going to be with me because there are a multitude of choices, and yet you pick one, and you will also change um, and have a number of jobs. So where do we start? I, uh, I also am in a place where I'm figuring out what's next, and so I'm kind of preaching to the choir myself here a little bit. Um, and I think I mentioned, but two things are true. You're not going to get where you're not going, so it's helpful to have goals. But you're also likely to end up somewhere you didn't expect you would end up, right? I think 15, looking back to undergraduate 15 years from now, I had no idea that I would be on a stage at John Brown University on a Monday night at seven o'clock, and yet here I am. And so the ways that God will write and will continue to write your story will always amaze you if you let it and you're open to miracles. One of the things that I've learned, this is the, the kids of some of the employees that worked at Kamek when we had a company picnic. And what I love about this is they're leaning in and they are, I don't know what they're chasing here, but there's this idea of movement. Where do we start? We have to start from somewhere. We, ha we have to move forward. And so the thing that I want to encourage you tonight through my story, and this is a very long-winded opening until we get to the meat of some stuff, is to just show up. Get on the bike, do the thing, show up where you're interested. You might not have this burgeoning passion that makes so much sense to go into this job or that job, but I bet you you have some interests 
That's like a little bit of a lower bar because passion is built. It's not discovered, it's built. It's not just like pulled out of a back pocket. So I would encourage you to show up where you're interested. For me, when I was in your shoes, I did not know what I wanted to do, and so I did what all business school students do that don't know where they wanted to do. I decided I was going to be a consultant and work on lots of different problems. <laughs> and so I applied to work at Bain & Company in the Dallas office. I moved there after undergraduate. I worked there for about a year, and I kept having this dream of I really wanted to get outside. I thought, what if we could get youth outside? And I, I just had this bubbling dream. And so a mentor of mine said, well, I know this nonprofit in San Francisco that works with youth from at-risk communities across the U.S. and helps connect them to mentorships and summer outdoor programming. And I said, oh my gosh, so that dream I have exists. Oftentimes it does. The things that you're thinking of, somebody else has probably thought of it too. Go find them and learn from them. So Bain had this program called an externship program where we could leave for six months of our time there to go try something new. And I said, I'm gonna leave and go work at this nonprofit. So I moved to San Francisco in my Honda Passport, drove cross country, found an apartment, and this was a really transformative time for me in my early 20s, where I got to take a lot of the learning from my first job and bring it into a completely new environment where I was acting on my own to help this nonprofit figure out how to increase their capacity to serve more students. And at the same time, the showing up thing just kind of caught wind for me, and I just kept showing up. I got on city bus number 10 to go to church, saw a girl with red shoes that looked friendly, and asked her if she would be my friend. I don't know if I exactly said it like that, but um, we ended up going to the same church, and fast forward five years, I'm in her wedding, and she's the one that connected me to the theology program that I did between Bain and business school. Um, after my time at Summer Search, I wish I had the speaker notes where we could see where I'm going. Uh, so there were many things that happened in San Francisco that were just the fruits of continuing to show up even when I was comfortable, uncomfortable or didn't know what the future held. That was a really great experience for me, connecting with youth whose time outdoors had really sh helped shape and give promise to their future. I remember a student named Anthony told me I stopped messing around when I had something to look forward to. And I thought there's so much power in that and there's something about the outdoor experience that aids this transformation. And so I stayed interested. Uh, I went back to Bain, worked for about another year and a half, and I got this wild hair that I was gonna spend my savings to go spend 89 nights in the wilderness because if I wanted to pursue a career, maybe outdoors, maybe not, I didn't know, it might be helpful to have actually spent some time outside. I grew up in Virginia. I spent a lot of time on dirt bikes and in ditches catching tadpoles. I think my family went on a motorhome trip, um, but I'd never really camped or done anything outdoorsy. And I thought, I'm just gonna see what that's like. I wanna figure this out for myself. Um, my parents didn't think that it was that useful of an endeavor. Maybe they thought it was useful, but maybe an expensive, useful one. And so my dad uh, advised me that I could live in their backyard for free as a way of discouraging me from going to Wyoming. But I said, no, I'm going to do this. Uh, leaving Bain, I wrote my farewell email to the company, and it was probably one of the strangest emails that people had ever gotten, that I was trading my hotel points for a campsite. And a girl wearing blue jeans and not so warm of a fleece jacket from Texas showed up in Wyoming. Uh, this is my crew, February of 2011, embarking on 89 nights outdoors, the first 12 nights which were going to be spent in the Bridger Teton National Forest in avalanche conditions. Um, I may or may not have cried in the tent that night, um, but this is a quote that I have since come to embrace. Uh, to be good at something, you must first risk being a fool, or said another way, every expert begins an amateur. None of us know what we're doing when we start. And I think it's only fair to acknowledge that. So after I spent 12 nights in the winter um, learning how to snow camp and avalanche rescue techniques, we went on a canoe trip. <clears throat> This canoe trip, our canoes held 400 pounds, a portable toilet, enough food and gear for 16 days on Green River between Vernal, Utah and Green River, Utah. When we got there, because it was March of 2011, there had been a, a, a typical freeze that year, and so we embarked our trip on a frozen river. 
The first day on that course, I fell through the ice, and that is a story for another day. Uh, but fast forward 10 days, and this is Jen. Jen and I are leaders of the day of a crew of 16, eight tandem canoes, which meant I was responsible for getting our group from point A to point B over about eight to 10 hours. My goal was for the people to get there safely and for us to arrive at the X on the map that I had very strategically placed the night before. We were gonna cross about 10 rapids that day and the day ended up being pretty gnarly uh, because I don't know how many of you are into water sports, kayaking, canoeing. Canoeing and rapids don't really go together, uh, but that's what we were doing because Knowles is <laughs> all about forging the more challenging path. And um, several of the rapids earlier, we had a couple people flip and people were wet and cold and hungry, but I was the leader of the day and gosh darn it, we were gonna get to that X. So we were about two rapids away from the end of our destination and we come up on a rapid on the map called Belknap Falls. The rest of the rapids on the map had rapid in the name. This one had falls. Uh, context clues were completely missed on me. And so Jen and I were saying, we're got, we scouted, got out of our canoes, so everyone's parked upstream. We climb out on these boulders and we are assessing the right line for everybody to run so that we can get to the X that's just a river bend down the map. Um, I don't know if you guys are knowing where this story ends <laughs> or not, but if you can't tell by this photo, the rapids only get worse a little bit further to the right. I think my camera died the day after this photo was taken, so it was pretty f interesting to go back and look at these photos and, and find this one. Um, so our, our crew was cold and hungry, and we called the line, and we said we're going to run it because we're going to get to that X. So Jen and I called the line, and I wish I had a, a video of what happens next, but I will, I will tell you. So uh, the team is, is looking pretty terrified somewhere to the left. We're like just straight to the left, cut around the rapid, and then we're going to go pull out into the eddy and, and go to shore. So one by one, everyone went. Well, the first group that went um, completely flipped right over the rapid, just garage sale, gear, canoe, life jacket, but it seemed okay, and we had one of our instructors had gone downriver to scout, and he flagged for the next group to go because Noel's instructors, if something is within a uh, realistic, like what's the word I want to say, if it's within a, a risk profile that's not inevitably life or death, they let you make your own mistakes. And so they let us run this rapid. The next group went, completely swamped the canoe. One group after the next went over this fall with little to no success, and I had a team of very wet, angry people looking to me and saying, why did you take us over this waterfall? And so we pulled out on the side of the river, set up an emergency camp. We didn't make it to our expected ex that I had marshaled everyone to in the beginning. And I remember having this really incredible, aha, you know, teachable moment, as Knowles talks about, when I realized that I had marshaled our team more or less over this obstacle that we really didn't need to cross because I was thinking about the wrong things. My goal that day was not how much progress can our team make safely on this river to where we end the day having learned something and we're, we're still together and we're unified, but I was so set on that X on the map that was just a pencil mark I'd made the night before. Um, and so this, this story is a tough one and we, we rallied together and ended up having a really great experience. The next day we got rained out, we built a big shelter, played cards in the sand, and I remember reflecting on this later and laughing about Belknap Falls. Like, be aware of context clues as a leader. Um, it was a really big lesson for me. And I would say, Noel's course, I would sum it up as me being out of my comfort zone. I think there's a, a place really far out of this circle that you just shouldn't go because it's probably not a good idea or we become paralyzed. But I think generally if we are on the edge of our comfort zone, that's where incredible magic can happen. And little did I know that this story would be one that I wrote to get my admission into business school as I retold the story of the things I'd learned as what kind of leader I want to be through something that was um, not one of my finer moments. After my Knowles course, I studied, I did a year studying theology at the Trinity Forum Academy. I wrote two papers on the theology of wilderness. It was a, a 
continued and uh, growing interest of mine, and I had applied to business school and gotten in. Before I went to business school, I went back to Wyoming because I thought I'd want to put these skills to use. I don't want them to go stale. And I spent an entire summer with teenagers in the Wind River Range climbing up mountains. This is Kendra. This is kind of an aside story, but I tell it because she is awesome. Um, Kendra is legally blind and she doesn't have depth perception. And I want to be more like Kendra. Uh, I remember we would be rock climbing and Kendra would go, and she had a really thick Chicago accent, which I can't do at all. I really wish I could. But she would go, Hales, how far is that rock? And I'm like, I don't know, five feet? And then she would just lurch and just completely flail out to go and grab the rock. And nine times out of ten, she did. Um, and I remember thinking that she was just a hero of mine. Uh, the wilderness is, is humbling. And I think there's a lot of places, this is the literal wilderness, Denali, Alaska, but I think there's a lot of places in our lives when we step out into new environments and it can really feel like a wilderness um, that really equalizes us as people. Um, no one is free from the grips of mosquitoes. And so this is just one of a photo of mine from business school when I took a bunch of buddies to Denali, Alaska to go backpacking and we're waiting for the backpacker bus, there's one road that leads into the Denali National Park, and you take the bus in and out, and you get dropped off on the side of the road, and then you have a unit, so there's a little backcountry hut that measures out 80 square miles of wilderness that you and like three other backpackers can have for a little while. It's really cool, I would encourage you to go. You also share it with grizzly bears. We saw like five or six on the trip, and mosquitoes, which are no fun, um, but I would, encourage you guys again to just keep showing up where you're interested because you never know what's going to grow and then how might that connect somewhere in your future. So I went to business school and I again was asking myself, what do I do? I don't know what to do with these emerging and growing passions of wilderness education and business. And I got asked to go to lunch with a guy named Ted Callahan who was on the board of Veritas Forum. Veritas Forum was interested in hiring me and the former executive director of my theology program who I'd worked with at Stanford for an entirely different reason. Okay, so I go to lunch with Ted Callahan, sit down, I share my story with him. He walks me to my bike at the end of a two hour conversation and he says, Haley, you wouldn't happen to know anybody that wants to run an outdoor gear company, do you? And I think probably two weeks prior in my apartment, I had written a set of note cards of things that I might want to do when I grow up. An outdoor gear company was on the short list. And as I'm clipping my helmet on Ramona Street, someone asks, hey, do you know anybody that might be interested? And so I knew he was talking about me, and so I kind of joked and said, yes, I might know somebody. Um, and this was where we met on Ramona Street. Again, I was meeting him for coffee for an entirely unrelated reason, something that also interested me. And then he said, how about you meet Greg? So Dallas, I was in Dallas between the Christmas and New Year's of 2014. Greg is the founder of Kamek. He started Kamek in 2011. We met for coffee in a strip mall in Coppell and started talking about our shared, shared love of the wilderness and our belief that wilderness can serve as an incredible backdrop for transformative experiences. And as believers, we also shared the belief that through outdoor and in, outdoors and engagement with creation, we can come to better know our creator and to know ourselves. And there's so much that happens interpersonally when we break down the walls of climate controlled boxes and screen bound existence. And we're just raw together in the wilderness. And we shared this vision. And so after three months of contemplating what to do next, I said, you know what, Greg, I'm gonna come join you in a portable building in Austin, Texas, with so three other people, and we're gonna try to build this dream that you have called Kamek. I'm gonna come partner with you to build Kamek. Kamek is not an explicitly Christian company, but that is our motivation as founder, and I was CEO when I left the organization just a couple months ago. Our motivation is that people through connection to Kamek may be turned on to spur maybe turned on to deeper and greater questions of meaning of life and purpose through their encounter with our brand, that we might be a conduit to show love to people and how we treat them through customer service or how they experience the unboxing um, of our products through the language on our website and our social media, that we might be a hub for community, love, and adventure. Our mission at Kamek was to equip and inspire life-changing adventure. 
that is something that could be accessible to anybody. But a few examples of what we meant by that, because life-changing adventure can also feel really big. Um, this is Ryan. He was an e-commerce manager for Kamek. He drove down 7th Street in Austin, saw our mural of Santa Elena Canyon. He and his wife love Big Bend, and he thought, you know what? I want to go work for that company. And so he applied. He met a girl at a, they were at a, a brewery that worked at Kamek, and he got in her face and he said, okay, this is why I want to work at Kamek, and here's all the reasons I'm great for the job. And so then he got 30 minutes of my time and sat down and had intentionally and thoughtfully prepared questions and reasons. And so you know what? We ended up hiring him, and he was an awesome teammate. And he and his wife went on to write one of the first ever hiking books to Big Bend. So his life-changing adventure was showing up where he thought he could add value and wanted to serve. This is, again, Denali, Alaska. Um, my aunt and mom are these two right here. Uh, I took them on their first ever overnight camping trip to Denali. They had no idea what they were getting into. Um, and after two nights of that trip, my aunt said, I am a more confident person. And at 50 years of age, that was incredibly inspiring to me. This is our customer, Adam. This is a lot of Kamek gear. We have our tent in the photo and our sleeping bag, and he likes to read stories to his children outside at night, and I would say that that qualifies for life-changing adventure. At Kamek, this is our brand symbol. Many people don't know this, but this is the symbol of the red female kangaroo. Greg was inspired by the female kangaroo as being incredibly brazen in the harsh conditions of the Australian outback, where she's very nurturing and protective of her young, but also travels in a pack, in a community. And we thought, you know what? This is really emblematic of the kind of brand that we want to build. The company was started on Kickstarter in 2011 with the first ever outdoor brand to launch on Kickstarter. The campaign was one of the top 10 highest grossing campaigns in the time on Kickstarter. And we went on for Kickstarter to be how we've, um, our capital provision for the company. So since then, we've launched over eight campaigns on Kickstarter. I'm happy to ask, answer questions about that later. Um, at Kamek, we pursue the mission of life-changing adventure in two primary ways. First and foremost, what we do as a business, we design really technical, high-performing outdoor gear to fuel your adventure. We use the analogy of wanting to be like Apple for the outdoors, where we design products that are incredibly technical but very easy to use and accessible because of how they're designed intuitively. And we also want to give back. So we are a 1% for the planet company. We're also a certified B Corp. And we often give 1% or more of our revenues, top line, to nonprofit organizations that further our mission to equip and inspire time outside. As a B Corporation, we also need to meet cer certain environmental and social standards. One of um, this is just a small way of how we think about doing this, not just in our give, but in the actual DNA of the products and services we provide as a brand. These are our Python straps. I noticed today when I was pulling in in front of the business school, there were a lot of hammocks out, which made me excited. And I don't know if you're in the room tonight, but there was one of you that there was a really high strung, I think it was a single rue hammock, and you were trying to get in Batman style. Is that anyone in here? Because that would be awesome. But I watched you from afar. The, the hammock was really high, and it took you a couple tries, but that person looked like they were having a lot of fun. Anyways, um, this is the tubular webbing python strap. So the way that we design the webbing to be not static webbing, but to be multidimensional, so it rolls when you're tightening it to a tree and doesn't damage the cambium or the bark of the tree, which is the reason a lot of hammocks have been banned from public parks. Uh, with our 1% for the planet donation, we sponsor a local organization called Explore Austin. Explore Austin is a six-year program for students in their sixth grade year of school where they join a 20-person student team and adventure together for six years in community every summer and every Saturday throughout the school year, they're meeting for different challenges and leadership development skill sets. Leadership development and skill acquisition. So this is the girls team that we sponsored. We started sponsoring them in sixth grade and we'll continue to sponsor them through their senior year. Their first summer, they do a pretty low key, I think car camping trip. And by the time they're seniors, they are forging their own adventures through the Wyoming wilderness where they're leading their peers on a six day overnight adventure. And the amount of confidence and self-efficacy that's built through these experiences for these students is really incredible. 
Uh, we have this saying at Kimmick that big adventures start small. I realize that this give is very high resource, but it's also really high impact. And we believe that small seeds and small change can truly change the world. Um, who knows which one of these girls could go on to be a leader in environmental regulation or in experiential programming for an entire community. This is Perla, she's one of the students that is part of the uh, student team that we support. And we've, her interview's up on our website. But she has this really great quote that I love, and she said, growth is what's fueled when there's more required of you than you think you can give. And I love that Explore Austin has been that experience for her. This is our supplier in China, so I'm just doing a quick overview of Kamek. We manufacture overseas, we design in-house. We have sewing machines in our office, we do product design in-house, but we manufacture overseas, and then we sell omni-channel online on our website, through Amazon, and also to retail wholesalers such as REI, which is the nation's largest outdoor specialty shop, and then Mountain Equipment Canada, Mountain Equipment Co-op in Canada. And we also have international presence in Japan and over in the UK. This is our supplier team. They're outside of Shanghai. We've partnered with them since the beginning and developed really special relationships with them. We went from hammocks, started out in hammocks, but the vision was not to end at hammocks. The hammock market, I don't know if you are aware because you follow outdoor industry trends, but the hammock market exploded in 2015 and then has been on a little bit of a, a drastic decline ever since. And so we kind of caught the end of that wave as a premium brand, but we're still trying to figure out how to get out of hammocks being the bread and butter to service really the broader mission of outdoor adventure through all types of gear. So we made sleeping bags, they won Outdoor Magazine's Gear of the Year, and just this past summer we've launched into packs. The plan going forward is to really streamline. We're gonna still continue to innovate, but stick with the core offering of products so we can really work on driving profitability and getting the business to a more sustainable level. Um, I recently left Kamek. I was there for five years and decided for personal reasons it was time for me to move on to something else. But as you noticed, I used we throughout this entire time talking about Kamek, and I still will because I'm so excited for the future of what this company holds and continuing to desire to further the mission of creating life change through adventure and really making magical moments. So we haven't talked about redemptive and business yet. Um, I think it's something as... Eva and I were talking about the talk. It's a very worthy calling, and yet something that is phenomenally challenging to do. Uh, Praxis, I've recently joined Praxis as a venture partner, working part-time with them to support their business accelerator program. They're based out of New York, and uh, some of you have heard from Andy Crouch or Dave Blanchard who work there, but they've brought really beautiful language to this idea of being a redemptive business. What does it mean to take redemptive action as an entrepreneur? and it's following the pattern of creative restoration through sacrifice in our work and in our lives. This is the only slide that's not a photo or a short blurb of text. <laughs> so um, this is a framework that they've put out which I would encourage you to investigate as you think about your own work, workplaces where you will go beyond graduation and companies that you would want to start. Uh, exploitative is the common thing we're used to seeing, we're used to seeing a lot of exploitative businesses in our culture. Uber and its drivers, Tinder and dating apps. We think about what is a need that people have? How can I leverage culture to benefit, to win? And so at worst, business can be exploitative in that it leverages culture and uses people for our own good. There's a lot of talk about conscious capitalism business for good, What's, if we get away from being exploitative, how might we use business to do good in the world, to be ethical, to respect people, to improve ourselves, to advance culture? And these are all good things. And yet I think as believers, we are called to stretch it one level further and say, how can we be redemptive in our pursuits? How might I renew culture through my work, bring justice and beauty and flourishing? How might I bless people, not just respect people, but within my means, be a blessing to others through my own sacrifice as a leader? So I think Praxis has done a great job providing language around what does it look like to be redemptive in one strategic vision, operating model, and leadership intent. So I'll share a few examples now that that language is something that's working language is newer for me as I look back on my time at Kamek ways that we, we strived as individuals who believe um, 
that really Christ is everything, like what are the ways that we worked that out in our business? So I have a few examples. This one is called the Sunda. Um, in 2016, we launched the first ever two plus person tent that also converts into an all-in-one hammock. How many campers, outdoorsy people, I can't, t are in the room, just give me a show of hands. Enjoy being outside, lower bar. Okay, I can't tell if you're all super engrossed, like this is just like, whoa, outdoors, or, okay. So, you're just like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. Okay, uh, we launched on Kickstarter, it was our fifth Kickstarter campaign, the first ever two plus person tent that launches, that um, also goes to a hammock. So, this product could be a ground tent, could be open air, uh, we also used this fabric called NanoNet, so there was black fabric above the tent so you could see the stars really well. We had a bunch of different modes. We raised almost $400 on Kickstarter. Um, we shipped this product on time in June of 2017, and within probably a week, we got our first inbound letter from a customer saying that the hammock had ripped in hammock mode. This seemed surprising. We'd done a lot of testing. We'd done stability testing, dynamic testing, made sure that we had a proper weight capacity on this product. We'd signed off on final designs. We didn't understand why this had happened, but we thought, you know what, maybe it's a one-off. Well, sure enough, a couple weeks later, or not another week later, like a day later, we got a few emails of people whose hammock had ripped on them. And within a matter of maybe two or three days, we started seeing a trend where there had been about eight products that had been, uh, people had inquired about ripping on them, ripping while they were sitting in it. And as the CEO of this company at this moment of just having shipped $400,000 worth of product, I started to lose a little bit of sleep at night. I thought, there, there, um, we had a customer post on Twitter a photo. So there were also people who loved this product. There was a girl who was going to be a missionary in Africa that posted on Instagram, this is my home for the next six months. And I thought, oh my gosh. And then there was another family whose kids had tied it up to a street sign and a tree. And he said, my kids are never coming out of this thing. And I thought, oh, the irony, like what if it breaks on them? And so this was a very serious matter. Um, and we weren't quite sure what to do. I think once you have a recall, you realize that most product companies over the lifetime of their company do a product recall. But we were a small team. We didn't have recall protocol. Uh, we didn't know procedurally or legally how to engage this matter efficiently and effectively. And I'm jumping forward a bit, but I, I, there are a lot of companies that should recall but don't because sometimes you can just get by without it. And if you look at an incident rate of product damages for a lot of product, we are falling within realm of, of what might be the problem. But we did the right thing. And we recalled every single product. Uh, I believe it's all public. You can look it up if you go to send a recall. If you just type it in, you can see the first letter I wrote to our customers. It's a public web page with about 20 points of communication where we immediately found a way to deploy communications across text, email, public channels, and we said, we are asking for your help in recalling this product effective immediately. And we gave our customers three options. The first was they could re return the product immediately, get full money back, no questions asked. Uh, this, I forget what the second option was. It was some kind of graduated interim between A and C, and C was that you would keep the tent, that you would mail back the body, the part that we had identified on ripping. Also, how am I doing on time? I know I have 45 minutes. Oh, okay, I should go faster. Okay, so, um, what type, like a hard stop. Okay, I just wanna be mindful. Business school, start on time, end on time. You told me that. <laughs> Okay, if you need to leave at 8 o'clock, you should feel free to leave, but I will try to finish before then so you can ask questions. Okay, so um, we had the recall up. Option C was you can return the tent body, which was the part that we had identified as ripping, or you can return that, you can keep the rest of your tent, which could function as a tarp or weather shelter, and you would not get your money back and you would stick with us until we fix the product. And if we couldn't fix it within six months, we would give you your money back. 
I went to, gosh, I went to bed that night, probably didn't sleep because if the vast majority of customers had chosen A, we would have been out of business. I think we had $200,000 at at, in the bank at the time, and so this could have been a catastrophic mistake. I will also mention that that's the moment when you call your board members and you say, I need help. We had legal counsel, and so the first letter that I wrote to our customers informing them of the recall was um, the most expensive email I ever wrote because we needed to make sure to do it right, so we paid someone to look at it. But I woke up the next morning and 85% of the customers had said, we will stick with you until you fix the product because we believe in this company. And I will tell you that was a huge sigh of relief and there were people saying, this is a company that did the recall right. Did we bless people through this? No. But within our means, did we try as best we could to do the right thing to provide recourse and to invite our customers into a problem so they could feel like they were solving it with us? Yes. And so our product designer at the time, when we recalled the product, we still didn't know what had gone wrong and who was going to be responsible for it. So we were taking on huge risk as a company, but we knew that the alternative could have been much more catastrophic. Um, Our product designer, Henry, he was an intern at the time, is now full-time, remarkable human. He unstitched every single stitch on that tent, every single piece of patterning, and identified that in mass production, our facility in Vietnam had cut. So in a tent, you've got four corners, right? Well, in order for the tent to turn into a hammock, you needed to have a piece of the end that could get cinched down. Um, And so... Oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank on the name. What is that called? Anybody know? Like a, like, yeah, essentially webbing, draw cord, but it was a sewn channel. That's, I'll just call it sewn channel um, that you could draw down on. And so at the corner, at the, at the um, corner of the body of the tent, in mass production for tents that don't have to hold people in suspension, this is common practice in mass production to snip a tiny bit, so that when the corners of the fabric are folded over and bar tack stitched, it's a much cleaner edge. Well, how would we have known that? Um, I think this is sometimes the cost of innovation is you're doing something new that hasn't been done before, and sometimes you don't know what to ask. But we realized that the factory had cut this tiny, tiny, less than eighth of an inch inseam in the corner of the tent that created a weak point so that when people sat on it in just the right way, it would rip open. Um, I would say, I don't know if our suppliers are believers uh, or not, but they absolutely did the right thing. They did not need to bear the cost of fixing all of this product. We were a new customer for them. We were a smaller customer for them, and they could have just written us off. And over international waters, we didn't exactly have legal negotiating power, but we asked them, we invited them into the process, and they repaired every single one of these tents for us to return to our customers. So from this experience, I learned that people can handle bad news. They can't handle bad behavior. Um, I think this is pretty basic, but for me, it was a really big insight. A lot of times, we're afraid to deliver bad news to people we love, to people on our team, to people that work for us. But it's oftentimes how we deliver that bad news and how we enter into difficult situations that really make up the difference and um, mark everything. I think our team was greatly impacted by this experience because there was a sense of pride of, yes, we do the right thing, we stand by our customers, and we fix things that aren't working. Um, I also learned that as a leader, you can make mistakes. People don't expect you to be perfect, but they do expect you to be consistent. Culture. This is our office. We got, so I mentioned moved to Kamek, worked in a portable building. We moved into this space in July of 2016. I've been camping in Arkansas in July, so I know it's hot. In Texas, it's extra hot, a little less humid, so pick your poison. But we moved into this office space. Um, This is what it looked like when we moved in. And one of the things that I've always told my team and that I believe is that if you're a part of something and you own the thing, like if you're working at the company, you can't expect anybody else to be more excited or to champion the thing you're doing more than the people in that office. And so I, what has always been a huge motivation for me is the people that I work with day in and day out, being ambassadors and champions of the brand that we are building and doing so in a humble way. 
Um, everyone who works at a small company is a walking billboard of that brand, and environment matters. How we shape the cultures and the physical spaces that we're a part of really matter. I, there's not this big reveal, um, <laughs> but we spent that summer building IKEA couches, putting bike racks on the wall. Um, this space through those double doors is now a renovated retail space that we worked with a design team in town to do really high end. So we have kind of a mix of retail and team space. But a few remarks on our cultures and ways that we've sought to bless people. Um, I did a survey to understand how the people on my team work best and what hours of the days that is. Most people find that they're most energetic and get their best work done between 10 and 2. And so we had flex hours. You are expected to be in the office between 9 and 3 and do our best work in person together. And then you could get your other work done when and where you wanted. It didn't matter. Um, we have quarterly team adventure days where we would get out of the office and adventuring. This is us on the Guadalupe River uh, getting outside together and actually putting into practice the things that we preached as a business. Um, another thing that I will mention briefly on culture is that as a leader and in business, you have to fight for unity. You have to really fight for your culture. And you have an outsized impact on what that looks like because you set precedent through your actions. You're also creating the infrastructure that people work within, the policies, the, the culture itself, and how you lead. And so oftentimes your team can be a reflection of your greatest strengths and your greatest weaknesses. And I saw that firsthand in ways that our team um, sometimes wasn't as quick to make decisions because I can be really big on consensus building and ways that in my shortcomings that was reflected in my team. And so I'd encourage you to really understand yourself and bring people alongside you at work that can help bolster your strengths. Um, another thing I wanted to mention and just learning about what it looks like to love people well and bless people in business, um, you have to do hard things. I've had to fire two people during my tenure there. We had several people move on in mutual capacities and um, we typically really nailed our hiring. We, we would attract phenomenal people and um, there are sometimes people who aren't the best fit for your team. They can be wildly talented and you can love them and know them but realize that they're maybe working against the culture that you're trying to set, or they may not be willing to follow and be so talented that they're actually pulling people with them. And so in one instance, we had to let somebody go, and it was, it was a really, really hard thing. Um, and so being, being Christian doesn't mean you don't do the hard things. You just care about the person, and you are, um, you're about the behavior, you're about the actions that need to happen, but you really try to care and love the person in the process. Um, Granny's Tacos, Granny's is owned by Maria and Armando Velasquez. They are from Mexico. This is a long story. I will tell you the abbreviated version. They are essentially surrogate grandparents. This is folks in Austin. We do monthly taco tries where we do kind of like a mini triathlon and end up and buy everybody tacos. And Granny's, they used to be on the side of our building when we first moved in. They were running out of money, so they were going to shut down. And we negotiated a deal with them. They dressed up, came to our office, and we said, we want you to park in the back of our office space and pay rent and tacos. And so they have been paying rent and tacos for the last three years. You can't see the megaphone from the side of their truck, but Granny and Maria love Jesus, and they are blaring gospel music, like not quietly, you know, you can kind of hear it, but it's like, hallelujah, as there's bachelor parties and bachelorette parties hungover from going to the bars in East Austin, getting tacos on a Saturday, and Armando will get you a taco and tell you he loves you, and it has been so awesome to see how they live out their faith through their work, because they are unashamedly, for Jesus, making the best tacos in town. That's Granny's. This is Marie and Armando. Um, Armando got his U.S. citizenship while we were at Kamek. We would practice English with him, and he let our whole team know he was applying. And when he went through the interview, it was fun to just help him think through some of his questions, and we ended up making an American flag cheesecake to celebrate, and they have just been such a blessing in my life. One of the last examples when you think about strategic vision for a company and how you might bring renewal to culture we wanted to bring our mission manifest. So a lot of ways we show that at Kimmick is through the gear we make, but we are, as people, all about experiences. So we hosted a 400-person campout 
in about an hour from our office, 40% of the people had never camped before, had never spent a night outside, and yet felt safe to show up and learn and be a part of this experience. That weekend, um, there's a lot of blog content. People are on town, like a dad came and fished with his sons for the first time. And our whole team, we wish we could do more things like this. Um, but we, there were 400 people there. We had a silent disco. There were people of all ages, all races, all walks of life. No one was on their cell phones. I mean, it truly for us felt like this glimpse of heaven where there was intergenerational celebration and flourishing and connection. And uh, that's probably my, my biggest highlight. And so I leave you that, um, well, I'll leave you with a few things in a minute, but I think Camp Kamek showed me in a lot of ways, and, and my whole experience at Kamek is really business is relationship. It's relationship with your suppliers, with your customers, with the people that work in your office, and the gospel is too. The gospel is about loving people, and that's a really hard thing to do because of our sin nature, um, but we can work against that in faith, in business, in the realms that God calls us to, and truly it's about loving people and finding opportunities to not just have an exploitative or ethical business, but have one that really seeks to bring redemption and flourishing to people. I'm a big David Brooks fan. He writes for the New York Times. He writes op-ed pieces. And it's, it's interesting if you follow his writings, I believe that he is coming to know Christ, um, previously not a believer. And he's written this book called The Second Mountain. And he talks about life of meaning and purpose uh, being expressed through primarily four commitments. To your faith, to a faith or philosophy, that's one, to a spouse or family, to a vocation, and to a community, and how these are commitments that are essential to leading a life of purpose and meaning. Well, if we spin that and we think of the theme of this talk of honor God, serve others, impact the world, you do that through those commitments, to the faith of Jesus, to a family, to a community, and to a vocation. You make commitment, and you're free to commit. You are truly free to commit in an imperfect world with a lot of desires and a lot of ways that God has wired you because you were made for eternity. And so bear with me for a moment, but I think we've been wired for eternity and yet we have a constraint of one life. So we have, you were telling me at dinner, you have so many interests and passions and you have to choose. It's like, what, that, that feels heavy because you don't want to get it wrong but we know that we were designed, we were made for eternity, we have the hope of an eternity where we will be able to exhaust all of who we are. Um, and so you can commit in freedom because you're not gonna miss out on what God has for you. And I'm reminding myself of that now as someone who committed to this outdoor thing in retail. I forgot to mention, I never wanted to work in retail Ever. I'm passionate about education, and then I showed up because I wanted to try my hand at operating a business. I'd been a consultant for 10 years, and I'd never actually tried to run something. And I wanted that experience, but it scared me. And I decided I don't want to live my whole life doing, not doing the thing that I'm afraid that I maybe won't do well. So that, I, I went to Kamek with that being part of the motivation. And I could enter into that. I could show up at a portable building with three people knowing that I wasn't going to miss out because I was made for eternity. Passion is built, not found. Finding your passion is pretty terrible advice because if you were like me in college, I was like, I think I like a lot of things, but I don't know what my passion is. And so just show up because passion is cultivated. It's like C.S. Lewis writes about that crusty gardener neighbor that isn't really nice, but then you grow affection for that person because you see them every day and you spend time with them. Passion grows through action. So do the work, trust God with the outcomes. Um, in all work, we can work against the effects of the fall. I'm going quickly. Uh, this is Whitney, she interned at Kamek. I love this face because she looks somewhat terrified, but also like she's gonna have a really good time. And so I wanna leave you that God is with you in all of it. Um, he's been with me in all of it, and I'm trusting that he is going to be with me going forward as I discern what's next for my career. And I would encourage you to be like Whitney, whether it's this summer or in a course at school or as you think about that next season of jumping out into the workforce. Go where you're interested. Lower the bar. Start with a small dream, with an interest, and show up and keep 
showing up even when you're afraid, and the Lord is at work, and he is going to do amazing things. Thank you. Do you want, is it eight? I'm so late. Okay. So we, uh, yes, Haley will take questions. So if anybody has a question, let me come to you so we can get uh, audio. So who has a question for Haley? So. I know you. Yeah. So uh, what led to your decision to leave um, Kamek? I knew I was going to get asked that one. Um, I think just, I like I said this last year, I got married, I had a baby, just things changed. And it was, I, when I left for maternity leave, I'd set the company up to really, I'd pushed on all decisions, we'd set the strategy, and I felt like the team was in a really good position to run forward without me. And when I looked at where the company needs to go for the next five to 10 years, I just felt like it was a good time for me to transition, both personally um, and professionally, to a next thing with full belief that the team's gonna do phenomenal things going forward. So, um, you know, when I showed up, I said, I'm committed until it's, it's time for me to not be committed anymore, and just through prayer and sermon, it felt like the right time. Um, so yeah, I'm, I will be, I'm currently working part-time for Praxis, and then we'll be figuring out my full-time job in the next couple months. Great. Who else has a question? Um, so you mentioned something, um, renewal of culture, and you said it several times, um, and you said that it was really important to you when running Kamek. Um a stricter definition would be beautiful, but more, how did you attain that and how did you work towards that um, intentionally on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, I, I hope a few of these examples illustrated that. I think there's, there's a few good books I could point you to, Andy Crouch writes Culture Making, but this idea that the material realm, what we're in in the here and now is of worth and is of value, and yet because we live in a broken world, like how do we build towards renewal to the way things should be to build flourishing and beauty and justice. Um, and so that is something to almost both strive for and surrender to in your work, but look at what are some of the ways that, that our culture, like what are some of the waters we're swimming in that we may not even realize we're swimming in? I think one at Campbell example from Kamek was we live in a hyper-technologically connected world where people are no longer having face-to-face -face conversations. And so as a brand, and we also live in a world where Amazon's trying to get all of us to believe that brand doesn't matter, but the Amazon brand is winning. And so does brand still have meaning? Can we as business leaders imbue meaning into our product by saying, here's a hammock so that you can go string it up and have a conversation with a friend where you're listening to each other? How can it lead to cultural renewal to have people actually looking up versus looking down? and to go on a hike with their family or to do something and connect in a way that brings flourishing and connectivity in a culture that's kind of pushing away from that as the norm. So I think you have to look at what, it, what does the, a lot of cultural renewal comes from imagination and praying for the spirit to show you imagination for the way that things could be and then to humbly work towards that knowing that you fail and come short all the time. Um, and then on a day-to-day -day basis, I think I tried to just really care for and, and love our team. Um, how do you know when you're ready to move on? Ooh, great question. When you start thinking about it. When you, when you start thinking about moving on, I think two things are true. One is maybe you're not appreciating what you have. I think we can believe the lie that the grass is greener somewhere else. And so we forget to be grateful for and anchor in, in the thing that's right in front of us that we're in. Um, and it's important in those moments to ask yourself, why am I still here? Because it's very, very important that we start with our why, and we can always claim that um, in, in any job, because when things get hard, you come back to your why. So if you're doing something on purpose, you'll have a why, and when you start thinking about moving on, maybe you've lost your why. Maybe because things in your life have changed or you're in a different season or you've grown in a certain direction, you need to recalibrate your why and you're going to have a different why for staying in the same place. You're going to reground yourself, appreciate it, maybe cast new light on it. Um, 
But if you, if you can't do that, and I believe that's where I would start because we're so quick to move on in our culture, but I think if you really realize this is no longer the place for me and you keep thinking about it, then I would encourage that it's probably time to move on. All right, one more question. What was your next step after college? Like after you graduated? <laughs> I went to work at Bain and Company. It's a strategy consulting firm in Dallas. So I spent three, a little over three years there. So they um, get hired by Fortune 100 and 500 companies to come in and do different problems, uh, strategy, cost savings, organizational change, so a myriad of different problems. So I worked on a non-alcoholic beverage case. I did a pet consortium product. I worked for a national home builder at the, at the height of the housing collapse in 2008. Um, so I worked a lot of hours. I did a lot of Excel. <laughs> so learn Excel. That's the you can learn it on the job. That's <laughs> what I did at no, 3 a.m. in college, <laughs> Haley. All right, the, uh, learn it in spreadsheets. Haley, thank you so much for the whole talk, but thank you especially for reminding us that we don't have to have it all figured out. Even if we're graduating in May, we don't have to have it all figured out. We can <laughs> show up, right? Yes. <laughs> all right, thank you. Everybody help me thank Haley for being here this year. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.